an echo on the breeze rustling through the leafy trees, and its mellow tones are these. By thy rivers gently flowing, Illinois, Illinois. O'er thy prairies verdant growing, Illinois, Illinois. Yes, Illinois is gently flowing rivers and great growing prairies. It's also great cities and little towns. But most of all, it's people, 11 million of them and counting. Before them, there were millions more working, building, to make Illinois the state it is today. 200 years ago, though, Illinois was rough country, peopled by only the hardiest of souls. There were two main communities in what has become the state of Illinois, Cahokia, south of Spanish St. Louis, and Kaskaskia, both on the Mississippi River. To the east, on the Wabash River, was Fort Sackville and the town of Vincennes, and to the north, Detroit. This was the Northwest Territory scene on the eve of the American Revolution. The exploits, daring, and leadership of one man and how he wrested that territory from the hands of the British are the focus of this story. His name, George Rogers Clark, father of the Midwest. With a small force of Kentuckians, Clark was able to secure the Northwest Territory for the United States. Out of it has since been carved the states of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, part of Minnesota, and Illinois. Clark was living in Kentucky, then a part of Virginia, at the outbreak of the Revolution. He conceived a bold plan to protect Kentucky settlers and to drive the British from the Northwest. He journeyed overland in 1777 to Williamsburg, then the capital of Virginia, to present his plan to Governor Patrick Henry. He convinced Henry that if a country was not worth protecting, it was not worth claiming. Clark was to raise a force of men to protect Kentucky against Indian raids, but secretly he was under orders to attack the British in the Northwest Territory. He decided to begin his campaign against the British in the Illinois country. So on June 26, 1778, he and 350 men left Corn Island, near the present city of Louisville, just opposite the towboat, and started down the Ohio aboard flatboats. Many of the men deserted when he told them their real destination was the conquest of Fort Kaskaskia. This reduced his forces to about 175 men. That evening, after twilight, the men quietly put their craft into Massac Creek and hid them, just a little way above Fort Massac, an abandoned French fort on the Ohio. Today's town of Metropolis is nearby. The fort has recently been reconstructed and has close ties with the Clark story, even though he and his long knives never set foot in the fort. On its site is a statue of Clark facing out toward the river under the three flags which have flown over the fort. From Fort Massac, the troops started inland toward where the present town of Vienna is located. South of Goreville on Illinois 37 is a stone marker showing the route they took. Several days of cross-country marching brought Clark and his troops farther and farther north and then northwest into Illinois country. Finally, on the evening of July 4th, they reached the Kaskaskia River about three miles above the town. In those days, the Mississippi was to the west of the town, but a flood in 1881 caused the big river to take over the former course of the Kaskaskia River, making the land area where the village of Kaskaskia was and is an island. Today, a traveler must go into Missouri to get to Kaskaskia. Clark divided his forces into two groups. One surrounded the town, the other went directly to the fort 
surprised the commander, and captured him. Before morning, they had disarmed the town. They had achieved victory without ever firing a shot. On Kaskaskia Island is the historic church of the Immaculate Conception, established in 1675. Services on this site have continued without interruption since its founding, though the church building has been rebuilt several times using some materials and remnants of the old structure. Nearby, in a separate building, is the Liberty Bell of the West, a gift to the Kaskaskians from King Louis XV of France. It is cracked now, its mellow tone spoiled, but it rang joyously loud and long on that July 4th night when Clark's Long Knives captured Kaskaskia. Back on the Illinois mainland at Kaskaskia is the Menard home, said to be the finest example of southern French colonial architecture in the central part of the Mississippi Valley. It was built by slave labor in 1802 by Pierre Menard, Illinois' first lieutenant governor, and is now a state memorial. Its furnishings indicate the luxurious living of that day. You can tour the home free and a curator is present daily. Up the Mississippi a short distance near Prairie de Rocher is Fort de Chartres. Though it had nothing to do with Clark and his Northwest campaign, it had been important first as a French stronghold, then as a British outpost until just before the revolution. The stone fort, now under restoration, is actually the third fort on the same site. Only the powder magazine remains of the old fort. Returning to the Clark story, on July 5th, the day after Kaskaskia's capture, a detachment of troops under the command of Captain Joseph Bowman headed northward to the other major settlement in Illinois at Cahokia. Bowman's men took over Cahokia without resistance. Still standing at Cahokia is the Cahokia Court House State Memorial. Built in 1735, it is the oldest house in Illinois, possibly the oldest private dwelling in the Midwest, and certainly the oldest of courthouses west of the Allegheny Mountains. After the Revolution, the Northwest Territory, won by Clark, was administered from here for a number of years. Not far from the courthouse is the Church of the Holy Family. It is located on the original mission property and is believed to be the only church now existing in the United States in the upright log style of construction common in the French colonies of North America. On the grounds of the old church is a gravesite believed to be the oldest Occidental cemetery in the West. The dead were buried here, one above the other, for more than a century and a half. Back at Kaskaskia, Clark was making plans with Father Pierre Gibault for the conquest of Vincennes. Father Gibault was a French priest whose sympathies were with the American cause. He became Clark's emissary, journeyed to Vincennes, and convinced the villagers they should accept American rule. Clark's victories in the Northwest Territory seemed almost too easy to be true, and they were. Just before winter, the British sent a contingent from Detroit to retake Vincennes and the fort. What they didn't know was that only two men were in the fort. The garrison surrendered to the much larger British force December 17, 1778. Francis Vigo, a Spanish citizen whose statue is on the banks of the Wabash at Vincennes, hurried to Kaskaskia to let Clark know the British had retaken Vincennes. He told him the British had decided against attacking him at Kaskaskia because of floodwaters and cold. Vigo also advised Clark that the British had detached their Indian allies and sent some of the troops back to Detroit. Armed with Vigo's intelligence, Clark worked out a daring plan to make a march across Illinois to Fort Sackville, a 180-mile trek which remains incredible, though thoroughly documented and proven. On February 5th, Clark and his forces left Kaskaskia in rainy and drizzly weather, as Captain Bowman recorded it in his Journal of the March. They traveled northeastward, 
their journey troubled by muddy land due to the heavy rains and an unusual February thaw. Near the present town of Ayuka, where the trails from Kaskaskia and Cahokia to Vincennes met, the Clark forces turned almost due east. Today, that junction point is marked by the remains of an old tavern and inn called Halfway Tavern. It, of course, was not there in Clark's time, but it was a stagecoach stop in the early 1800s, and it is believed Clark and his men did spend a night a few miles east of here. West of today's Lawrenceville, the Clark forces headed south along the Ambras River waters to find a safe crossing of the Wabash. Finally, Near the present town of St. Francisville, below the point where the Ambras River empties into the Wabash, they decided to make their crossing. Clark had rafts provided for the sick and frozen, but most of the men walked across the river in shoulder-high water under cover of darkness. They were now about six miles south of Vincennes. They camped overnight and rested another day at this spot. While there, they even heard the morning and evening guns from Fort Sackville. The next day, they moved northward. Finally, at about one o'clock on the afternoon of February 23rd, Clark and his men arrived at their long-sought destination. Clark sent a warning into the village, advising against resistance. At sundown, the little army marched into town. This marker near downtown Vincennes indicates where Clark took over a home as his headquarters. At 8 p.m., they began firing on the fort. They also used a stratagem which won them victory. They built fires and marched flags and men around and around, making the British commander, Colonel Hamilton, think he was being attacked by a much larger force. After some delay, Hamilton surrendered. Thus, George Rogers Clark saved the old Northwest for the new American nation of Orning. The British ceded the territory to the United States with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Clark's victory is commemorated by the George Rogers Clark Memorial, which is built on the site of Old Fort Sackville. The memorial is a magnificent building housing seven large murals of significant moments in the history of the Northwest Territory, including Clark's conquest. The paintings in the memorial are Kentucky, Entering the Great Valley, depicting Clark and a group of pioneers entering Kentucky, typical of the great stream of migration across the Allegheny Mountains. Cahokia, peace or war with the Indians, showing Clark offering an Indian council a choice of the red belt of war or the white belt of peace. By his personal force and bravery and his understanding of Indian nature, they were led to choose the white belt. The Wabash, through wilderness and flood, picturing Clark and his little army marching across Illinois on the way to Fort Sackville. Vincennes, the British barrier to the west, with Clark and his men beginning the attack on the British outpost on the Wabash. Fort Sackville, Britain yields possession, with Hamilton surrendering his sword to Colonel Clark and leading his troops out of the fort. Marietta, the northwest, a new territory, depicting the reading of the Ordinance of 1787 on July 13th that year at Marietta, Ohio, establishing the region as the Northwest Territory. Winthrop Sargent, Secretary of the Territory, reads the document as General Arthur St. Clair, the governor, stands behind him. St. Louis, the way open to the Pacific, showing the acquisition by the United States of the upper part of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Captain Amos Stoddard stands at attention, and beside him is Meriwether Lewis, who, with George Rogers Clark's youngest brother, William, will soon leave to explore the far northwest. Thus is shown, step by step, how the capture of Vincennes made possible Louis the Louisiana Purchase and the westward expansion of the United States. A short distance from the Clark Memorial is the old cathedral. This building was built in 1826 on the site of the first church, which was constructed about 1732. 
It was in the older church that Hamilton surrendered to Clark. In downtown Vincennes today is Marone's Restaurant. This fine eating place is integral to the Clark story because on its site stood a store which played a tragic role in his life. In 1786, he was sent back to Vincennes to establish a garrison. Food and supplies failed to arrive, so Clark and his men commandeered the goods in the store, and the state of Virginia refused to pay the debt because Clark lost the receipts. The store owner filed suit against Clark personally and won. In an old cemetery in southwest Vincennes is the grave of Francis Vigo, whose help to Clark was instrumental in the American capture of Fort Sackville. He died in abject poverty, and it wasn't until 40 years after his death that the U.S. government paid his burial expense and finally made a settlement with his heirs for the financial aid he gave Clark during the Revolution. In northeast Vincennes, and near the campus of Vincennes University, are several significant historical buildings from Indiana's territorial period. Perhaps the most important is Grouseland, the home of William Henry Harrison, first governor of the Indiana Territory and ninth president of the United States. It was built in 1803-04 of brick made near the town with foundations of stone brought up from the river. The architecture is similar to that of Harrison's birthplace, Berkeley, in Virginia. An unusual feature is the bow end of the council chamber. Harrison was the hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811, which gave him his rallying cry in his 1840 presidential campaign, Tippecanoe and Tyler II. A short distance away is the building which was the first capital of the Indiana Territory, established in 1800. From here, Harrison governed the territory. In 1803, upon completion of the Louisiana Purchase, the district of Upper Louisiana was added to the territory governed from Vincennes. Next to the capital is a replica of Elihu Stout's printing office from which he published the Indiana Gazette and Western Sun, the Indiana Territory's first newspaper. In 1830, 21-year-old Abraham Lincoln stopped in Vincennes on his way to Illinois, and tradition has it that he became very interested in the printing process when he saw a press for the first time in Stout's shop. A few feet away is the restored one-room home and birthplace of Maurice Thompson. Born in 1844, he was the author of Alice of Old Vincennes, the famous historical novel of Colonel Clark's capture of Fort Sackville and Vincennes. Vincennes has still more interesting historical locations which are too numerous to cover in the Clark story. But Vincennes University runs its Trailblazer Railroad around the town to the most important ones, including those having to do with Clark. So this man, who gave so much to his country, through his efforts and stamina, received nothing from the state of Virginia or the United States government, not even his pay. After the Revolution, Clark returned to Virginia to try to collect the money owed him and his men for their years of service. The Virginia legislature passed on to the federal government the responsibility for paying Clark his salary and settling the bills he had run up for supplies. At last, Clark was given several tracts of land, but the federal government then ruled that Clark's creditors could have the land in payment for the bills he had signed to supply his troops. His men fared a little better. The federal government set aside tracts of land for the Long Knives in Clarksville, Indiana, and southeast of St. Louis, in what is now the town of Columbia, Illinois. Clark had conquered vast tracts of territory and made it safe for settlers, but Clark had no home for himself for 30 years after the Revolution, living with one or the other of his brothers. Finally, he built a log house on the north side of the Falls of the Ohio in Clarksville, Indiana. The house is gone, but a stone memorial marks the spot. His view must have been even more lovely than it is today. Clark suffered a stroke in 1809 while living there. Later, because of his debility, 
he fell into the fireplace, severely burning his right leg. The burn became infected, and amputation was necessary. The operation took two hours without anesthetic. Clark asked for a corps of drummers and fifers to play military marches during the ordeal. No longer able to care for himself properly, Clark left for the last time the Northwest Territory he had won and crossed the Ohio River to live with his sister Lucy Krogan in Kentucky. Today, few tourists traveling on US 31 realize when they cross the Ohio that they are on the George Rogers Clark Bridge. On the other side of the bridge is the modern city of Louisville, founded by Clark. His place in the history of the city is marked by a plaza near the waterfront, which is dominated by a statue of Clark. His image faces the river, which played such a big part in his life. Behind him, the modern skyline of downtown Louisville. Lucy Clark Krogan and her husband, Major William Krogan, had built Locust Grove, a beautiful Georgian-style home, around 1790, near the present city of Louisville. The Krogan homestead has been restored and is now much as it was when George Rogers Clark came here to live in 1809. Many mementos of his career are at Locust Grove. Others, such as his watch and his compass, can be seen at the Filson Club, a historical organization in downtown Louisville. An interesting facet to Locust Grove is the wall built around three sides of the homestead called Ahaha Wall by Kentuckians. It was so named because when Indian raiders were sighted, the settlers could crouch behind the wall and fire at their attackers. Presumably, the citizens then had the last ha ha on the Indians. The Krogans were well to do and Clark was well cared for at Locust Grove, but in 1813, he had another stroke which left him speechless and all but helpless. He spent the last five years of his life in a wheelchair. On February 13, 1818, General George Rogers Clark died at the age of 66 in this bed. Over the bedroom's fireplace is a portrait of the man which was painted just months before his death. In it, you can see the eyes of a tired, dispirited old man, a man who in life was in near poverty, who had done much for his country, but whose country did so little for him in his lifetime. Two days after his death, General Clark was buried in the family graveyard behind the house. At impressive services, a famous judge from the area delivered a short talk on the life of General Clark. Only one sentence of that speech was recorded for history. The mighty oak of the forest has fallen, and now the scrub oaks may sprout all around. General Clark's body rested in the family graveyard with the Krogan family until it was reinterred at Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville in 1869. Over the nearly 200 years since General Clark made his famous march, he has not received praise and commendation accorded other heroes of the American Revolution, such as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Patrick Henry. To make matters worse, he is often confused with his brother William, who was sent by President Jefferson with Meriwether Lewis on their famous exploration of the far northwestern portion of the United States. Even so, he wasn't totally forgotten in the nation's bicentennial. Some of the trails he traveled have been marked in his memory. And in late June and early July 1976, about 30 Illinoisans followed his trail through the wilderness. Somehow though, such recognitions as trail markers or monuments might have faded in importance to General Clark if he were alive today. Besides, his grave in Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville is near Interstate 65 with its bustle of traffic. And on a cold, crisp, Kentucky winter's evening, when all is still but the north wind, the mournful hoot of a towboat plying the not-too-distant Ohio River comes wafting over the cemetery. People, 
and commerce, living in safety and freedom in the old Northwest through the efforts of a man of whom they may never have heard. That would probably be enough now for General George Rogers Clark. Bobby.